Hi, I'm Namita Ramani, founder of Avab Digital and your host for Successful Marketing Small Businesses Podcast. Welcome again to the episodes and I want to hear your feedback guys. You need to share with us how are you how is the podcast? Are you guys enjoying? Are you enjoying the guests? I've now I've, I want to hear your questions from myself or the guests. Please 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 do that for us on whichever channel you are watching. Do ask us questions in the comment box below and let us know your feedback, your views, your questions. And without further ado, I want to move into today's podcast. And today I have a very beautiful guest with me. Her name is Nina Ubhi. Born in London, Nina had a passion for art and creativity at a young age. A self-taught and published makeup artist and beauty coach, Nina has worked with large beauty brands like Estee Lauder, Elizabeth Arden and Knievo, and was also a magazine beauty editor where she collaborated with countless makeup brands and celebrities for high fashion editorials. With over a decade of experience as a makeup artist, Nina provides picture-perfect makeup services to an elite and global clientele, giving them flawless and iconic looks. She's the region's most influential makeup artist with a following of almost 300,000 followers on Instagram and is also the founder of Premium Mink Lashes which can be bought online from her website ninaobi.com and luxury retailers like Bloomingdale's, Harvey Nicholas, Unas and more. Her mission is to inspire others through artistic and authentic flawless beauty with a vision to become an international inspirational and multifaceted beauty brand with core values of authenticity, empowerment, innovation courage and honesty welcome 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 nina hi however we have one more guest today and he's nina's life and business partner bobby chagar who is also the operational backbone to the brand bobby has a strong background in wealth management retail and commercial banking and property development born in an entrepreneurial family bobby learned at a young age that hard work and dedication is important to run a successful business with years of experience under his belt, he decided to switch gears in his career and support his wife's dream to build an international beauty empire. Welcome, Bobby. Thank Welcome you. to our podcast, guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show to share your journey. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. It's the first time we have two guests on our podcast, nice. so it's interesting. <laughs> um, let's start with Nina. I have worked with your father before, so I know he's uh, he's into construction. He's an engineer into construction and stuff. And your younger brother is working with your father. Yes. And uh, your mom, is she a housewife? She's a housewife now, yeah. Uh, before she was into... She was in more kind of retail before that. And it was always just something for her to just pass time. You know, for her, she's come from a very traditional family. Mm -hmm. So she didn't necessarily kind of get to pursue or even maybe figure out what her passion or dreams were, to mm -hmm. be honest. So um, my dad's always supported her in doing whatever she wants to do, but she's um, a lady of leisure. <laughs> <laughs> so where are, you, uh, where are you born and brought up in London, right? I was born in South London um, and I was there probably until I was about 14, 15 years of age. Mm -hmm. And then we moved from London to Reading which was uh, actually quite different for me because it's the outskirts of London. Yeah. Um, it was not as uh, diverse as what London was. So it was quite a difficult period for me to kind of settle in and make new friends. So yeah, <laughs> it was uh, quite different to central London. <laughs> Um, but where are you guys from otherwise? Uh, you are Indians? Right? Yes, we're Indian. Um, we're both Indian. Um, my mom is actually born and brought up in Uganda and my dad from Nairobi. Okay. Um, so it's a bit of a mix, yeah. uh, but um, that's something that Bobby and I had in common because his family's also from Nairobi. So, you know, it's, in it's interesting when your family is all multifaceted. Like from all over the world yeah. or in different parts of the world and you get influences from those parts as well in your uh, in your food of course also in the way you do things yes I really definitely it matters that's why I, I, I love to ask where the guests are from what are their backgrounds what do their parents do because also what your parents do impacts what you do because you learn from your parents so when I was working on my questions, actually, I read um, on online about you that right from the age of 16, you were uh, scouted for a modeling job. And that's where you learned about how, that a face can be painted and get, like a masterpiece. And that's what got, into you, got you into this industry. I would love to hear the story around it, what happened uh, and how you got into 
making making makeup as your career so um growing up i actually wanted to work in the travel industry um i didn't really know what exactly but i just knew i wanted to do something that involved a lot of traveling i wanted to travel the world um and that's all i knew but then when i was about 16 m- me and my best friend at that time um we entered a competition in one of those kind of teenage magazines that you get and the competition was that you could win a weekend break away. I think it was somewhere in Europe. Mm-hmm. And I knew, we both knew we were never going to be allowed by our parents to actually go uh, alone at that age. Yeah. Um, but we entered it anyway and we thought, you know, it's a bit of fun. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. And then we got a phone call saying that, you know, you haven't won, thankfully, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, they said they'd like uh, me to come in and uh, do a shoot for them. And at that point, it was a very well-known teenage magazine. You know, everyone in school used to used to buy it and read it. So um, my friend and I were both scouted through that competition. Uh, we went in for the photo shoot. I absolutely fell in love with the whole buzz of shoots. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, I had never even thought about modeling or anything like that. And thankfully, my mum and dad were very supportive of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a few shoots from there. I then started doing more and more shoots, but I was always the one who would go backstage and change my makeup. Mm-hmm. I hated what they used to do with my makeup. So, and I was always known at that age to to be the one who was really good at putting makeup on. I never used to wear a lot. Mm-hmm. It was always either just eyeliner or, you know, maybe I've done my brows. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always made sure it was done perfectly. Mm-hmm. Like symmetry was so important to me. So um, I then realized from that, that I didn't actually enjoy the modeling side. I wanted to be behind the scenes and I wanted to be responsible for creating what goes in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, I decided to just start in makeup. But back then there there weren't many kind of makeup schools, you know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't as popular as what it is now. Which Um, year are we talking about? Oh gosh, it was, it was around 20 years ago, Mm -hmm. about, about, well, over 20 years when I, I'd say I officially decided, right, I'm, I'm gonna, I started as a freelance makeup artist. So for, for quite a few years, I, I was modeling, mm-hmm. um, but I, everyone knew me within our kind of team of people who used to model together, all the photographers, all the stylists, they all knew that I was the one who would go back to the bathroom and change my makeup. And then the other models would come to me and say, can you do mine as well? I prefer what you've done. <laughs> um, so it kind of went from there. Yeah. Um, and then I decided uh, to go freelance. I didn't know who to kind of go with in terms of training. So I decided to, I looked into it because I thought that's something that you needed. Yeah. But one, it was uh, very expensive mm-hmm. for, th- for then. Um, and secondly, I wasn't really fully sold on the type of makeup style that these people were teaching. Yeah. Um, I started working for retail beauty brands. So I was uh, account manager for Estee Lauder. So I ran um, one of their stores or concessions in central London. And from that, I started learning a bit more about the small, smaller amounts of the business side, mm-hmm. um, but more about kind of the, in, the in-house training they used to give. But even that, I thought to myself, it's all about rules. And to me, it shouldn't be that you have to do something this way and you shouldn't have yeah. to do something this way. You know, when they used to say, you you have to always put the dark shadow on this side of the eye and this is where the lighter one goes. And that didn't sit well with me. So I thought this is just kind of proven to me that I don't want to actually be trained by anyone. Hmm. And I want to just build my own experience. So literally have spent the last 20 years building my own experience and and, I do believe you're still learning. So for me, it's always, it's about evolving with the times as well. And I think doing things is more learning than doing theory. Yes. When you're actually doing stuff. Yes. Like I'm not an MBA. I've just a simple college degree. But running a company is an MBA in itself, you know, much more than an MBA. I know what else is multiple MBAs every year, I guess. (laughs) So, um, interesting. So makeup just flowed into your life. It just yeah. happened. It's meant to be doing this. Yes. And this I'm lucky because I managed to still fulfill my original dream of traveling because I never realized that this would involve as much traveling as what it does now. And now I travel the world yeah. and I get to travel the world with my life partner and my business partner, yeah. which makes it great. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of evolved 
I, I've, I wouldn't say that I'm lucky actually, because I think that I worked hard to ensure that I could kind of fit the traveling into my life and kind of merge it into my business so that it involved that traveling. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy with where it's gone, but it, it's, it's hard work as well. I want to hear about the hard work. So this business actually depends mostly on referrals, as I understand. If some, you go to someone and then she refers you as a makeup artist. I'm talking yes. about them. You have many different verticals. I, I understand you, yes. you are a makeup artist. You are a coach. Uh, you have the mink lashes business, which I'll talk about it later. Um, and in, within makeup artists, you do daily makeups. You also go for wedding makeups. I think it's a wedding thing that's make, uh, that gets you travel the world. How How difficult or how easy was it to get the business rolling to start making it calling it a business so um to begin with I was for, for many years like I said I was working for different beauty brands um, and that kind of helped to build my experience in different products different the way different brands work so I understood their kind of uh signature style of each brand if you see what I mean you know oh. so it was really a case of understanding how these brands work and what their products are like but when you're working for those brands they they teach you everything about their products so the yeah. ingredients why it's so good for you yeah so that really helped me as well because these are the products that I would be using correct yeah and if I don't know about the products that I'm using then there's no point me even applying them yeah. because you could get anyone to apply makeup and maybe they are artistic and maybe they can paint a great face but if they don't know about what they're applying then i think that that isn't necessarily the best person to have uh, do, your do your makeup yeah so so for me it was a case of really understanding everything from the foundation level and understanding why i'm using what i'm using you know why is that good for different skin types how is that going to work well for different skin tones um, how am I going to enhance someone's beauty as opposed to kind of masking it? Mm -hmm. So I also started working for a hair salon at one point because I really, I realized that there were makeup artists out there who were freelancing like myself, who yeah. may have been trained, um, but they were only offering makeup. And I thought, let me just see if I can kind of do the hair side as well, because that would kind of make me stand out a bit more from them. So I think that is when I would say it really kicked in where I thought, right, this is where the business mind kind of kicked in. I thought, how can I differentiate myself from my competition out yeah. there? So I started working for the hair salon um, and I picked up so much there. And that is where I learned and carried on kind of teaching myself uh, the hair side of it as well. I don't necessarily fully advertise that I'm also a hairstylist because I only offer makeup and hair and I don't offer only hair. Because okay. makeup is my first and foremost for me. Yeah. Um, and I think from that, um, I started, then I started working for a magazine. Mm -hmm. I basically, uh, emailed them and said that, you know, I'd love to do some shoots for you for free. I mean, when I come, when I look at the last 20 years compared to how easy it is nowadays for people. Yeah. Because of social I, media. It's mm -hmm. so different. Like my portfolio was not on, it was not digital. I had a leather binder book, the old school portfolio where, you know, you have your images and you yeah. take it to an agency and they look at it and it's all about, right, they always ask you, you know, where's yeah. your book? We need to see your book. Yeah. So you, you, you would make sure you had the nicest leather <laughs> binder for your images. Yeah. And um, it, it was very different. So I had to do a lot of free work because I didn't have any experience. I didn't have any kind of training. So I had to prove myself. I also found it, found uh, something that I decided to do at the beginning when I first started was I realized I needed a portfolio. Yeah. And I thought, how am I gonna even get these images? How am I gonna pay for a photographer? My parents were supportive, but at the same time, I also know being Indian parents, they were very kind of, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> let's just see where this goes. I know. <laughs> so I think the girl child is the, especially, I say and I'm the oldest, judged, but it is, yeah. yeah so, so you have more than two siblings, you guys? Oh are... yes, yeah, I have um, two more sisters and a brother. Oh, okay. And um, I basically went to my grandmother. She'd always lived with us. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, this is, you know, what I want to do and I really love it. It's, you know, it's a passion of mine and I think I can be successful at it because yeah. it's something that I love. Yeah. And she said, right, okay, I just want you to, I, I will invest in your first kit for you. So she invested in my first kit. And she said, you get what you need to get, but I need you to promise me that you are never gonna quit. 
and that you are always going to do this and make a success out of it. And that has to be the one thing that stuck with me because I just thought I can't, I can't let this go now. I've got to prove that I can do it. Yeah. And I thought, how am I going to create my own portfolio? So then I realized that, right, okay, I need to somehow figure out how to take photos. I need to then figure out how to use Photoshop. So I'm self-taught on Photoshop as well. I edit everything myself. I edit all my videos myself. Um, I bought myself a camera, which wasn't great, but it did the job. Yeah. And um, I asked a model that I figured out what kind of forums there were online where you can, you know, you have stylists and photographers who are all willing to do kind of uh, bot like shoots with each other just to collaborate to increase their portfolio. And I got a model on board, took the pictures myself and I edited it myself. And the model luckily had a bit of experience in modeling and she submitted the same photos to black hair and beauty magazine and it made the cover (laughs) and I was that that for me was something it showed me that you know I didn't get a professional photographer I didn't get any of of all the fancy stuff that costs so much and I did it myself so I then further carried on teaching myself all the different aspects ultimately I didn't want to be in a position where I felt like if I put a shoot together I didn't know what everyone's role entailed yeah if I don't have access to a photographer, I need to know that I can do it. If I don't have access to a retoucher, I need to know that I can do it. So do you enjoy doing it? I do, yeah. Because I think sometimes it's been a bit difficult to kind of, you know, sometimes you have yeah. to step away and let someone else do it, yeah. which um, I think my husband has found very difficult <laughs> with me. But um, I, I still don't regret it because I feel like at least now I know how to do every aspect of that. work, yeah. Because in, in a business, there are many aspects you don't really enjoy. Like for example, you only enjoy makeup and hair. But the rest technical goes away to the people who know how to do it. That's how I yeah, understand. Yeah. Um, so uh, coming back to the question again, when it when it, what is a biz like how did it become a business it, you are still freelancing You're yeah still, I, I was still so, freelancing and I think after a little while um, I started getting bookings so it was like first it was friends and family so I was doing like weddings like uh, guests and things and then I started um, I put my website together again something mm. I created completely myself <laughs> and I did it was one of those ones that you can create yourself yeah. on these like Wix and, and things these, yeah. like that yeah. so I created it myself and I thought right I'm just really got to hope people just come across my website mm. now um, I started I registered I remember actually I registered um, it's weird thinking back to it because you forget all these yeah. things yeah. but the way that I managed to get my name out was go on to every wedding site that there was online mm-hmm. And register myself as a vendor, as a supplier. So you know how you had like DJs, yeah. every uh, the, one of those portals yeah. that everyone goes yeah. to. Yeah. And I registered myself on every single site you can possibly imagine. Um, and then that's when I started, uh, I started at a low rate because I was still new. Yeah. Um, I remember having my first ever bride, which was in Southampton. Uh-huh. I still remember. And I remember just praying the entire time that I hope I do. I hope this turns out best, well. Only, this yeah. poor girl does not know she's my best bride ever. Oh, <laughs> and uh, it went really well. She uh-huh. loved it. And from there, Is that it was way? very. It was a very slow trickle yeah. of of inquiries that came in. But I made sure that. I I was very thorough with every inquiry. So I had a template put together so that every inquiry that came in over email, it looked professional. That's one thing I've stuck with the entire time since Mm -hmm. right from the beginning that I'm the customer services there Mm -hmm. because that's something I saw being in that industry in the UK that it was lacking in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Asian industry in the UK, I didn't see it. I, I just used to, I used to see makeup artists turn up for bookings in jogging bottoms with their hair roughly tied up and I couldn't understand why you would let that be a representation of your brand. Yeah. So for me, from from day one, I made sure my makeup was com- was flawless every time, no matter where I was going. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I used to get stopped at petrol stations with by people saying, "Who did your makeup?" And then I'd give them my card. Mm-hmm. So I was just a walking advert for my work. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's how it should. That's be. how yeah, which I still believe it should be. Yeah. 
Um, and that's how it kind of got, that's how it started from there in terms of the business side of it. It did get to at the point where I was taking on quite a few bookings. And then with the magazine, I became beauty editor. I was doing so much free work for them. Yeah. Eventually I asked to be paid. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then I started doing covers and, and because of working with the publication, that also helped to kind of bring in, it gave me that kind of bit of support in yeah. the industry. To bring the name out. Yeah. Did you ever always, did you ever actually think that this will turn into a business or you thought, okay, I'll just keep doing the freelancing, just keep doing what it's happening, like actually, or did it become business when Mink Lashes was born? No, it became a business way before that. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't think to myself that this, when I was freelancing, it, it wasn't, something where I thought this is just something on the side for me. I knew that I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be huge. I wanted to make sure that this business was a success and I wanted to be a lot more business savvy compared to my competitors that were yeah. out there. And it, that was always in my mind. It, it was it was a very clear focus of mine that, and I know I may not have, have done everything in the right way in the sense that you know now I, I i have bobby's expertise on board and there are things that i was lacking that he brings to the table so i wasn't necessarily right up there to his mark but i did the best that i could do mm -hmm. and i made sure that i had this very clear focus of this is going to be my career and i have to make this a success because yeah. if i don't make enough money from this then what am i doing yeah ultimately that is the goal do you have a team the, we have a very small team, which is just myself and Bobby. <laughs> but we we are very, um, we're very hands-on. This is literally what we do day in, day out, mm -hmm. our business. And obviously, like you said, there are so many different parts of it. Yeah. It's not just the makeup. So um, we are, we do have a team, but we outsource members. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case that we have people sitting with us day in, day out. Yeah. But we do have a we do have a specific person who manages, obviously, the website. We mm -hmm. have someone who manages the marketing side now. So it's slowly yeah. growing. Yeah. And um, because this is Nina Obi, this business is all about Nina Obi. If Nina is working, the business is coming. If Nina is not working, it's not coming. So the business totally depends on you as a person. And there would be days and months where you wouldn't want to. You know, there's times when you don't want to work. Maybe you want to go for a long holiday, which means the business is on a standstill. Of course, now I understand things are different with you have different new verticals that have joined in. Mm -hmm. But until that didn't happen, uh, you were okay with, with it being like, even in future, let's suppose let's take the makeup line. All mm -hmm. this knowledge is inside Nina. Only Nina knows everything about the brands, uh, the products that you use, how it's important to which face and what skin type and everything. Are you planning to create multiple Ninas? I think for me, um, I think you're right in that because it's something that I've had to kind of think about very carefully over the last few years in terms of like, how how am I gonna develop the business in, in yeah. a way which maybe doesn't solely rely on just my knowledge, yeah. you know? Um, and, and we are kind of progressing towards that way. Like with the lashes, we've obviously launched with the lashes, but our aim is to develop a full line. So we don't, it's not something that we're just stopping there, but we are very, we're very um, specific about ensuring that we, if we launch one product, we do it properly. Mm. We don't rush into right now. So we're going we to go get, into the product side of business. Yeah, I think not so much into the service side of the I business. I think it's it's going to be a bit of both. Mm -hmm. The product side is something which is obviously still fairly new for us in the sense that we've been around for over a year now. Yeah. And it's picking up very nicely. Yeah. But the service side, I think, is always going to be there because it's something that I love. Yeah. If I don't have that and I don't do that, yeah. I feel like my I'm missing that creative side. Yeah. So I don't have, I don't envision completely leaving that side. Okay. That's not my, I don't have a goal to write. I hope that I don't have to do that because I love it too much to have yeah. to, to think that, you know, for me, I've got to always have that creative side of me. Like I don't plan when I'm anything to do on the creative side, I don't plan. And my clients know as well. I don't sit there and send you a mood board of what look I'm going to create because for me, it's like painting. I have to have you in front of me. You are my canvas and I get into my creative zone at that point. So I always say, I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily tell you exactly what I'm going to do, but I just, just know that it's going to look amazing by yeah. the end of it. So for me, I need that. That is what I thrive on. And that helps me develop products. If yeah. you see what I mean.
understand. It, it, it I just can't, links together. Yeah, it links together. Like yeah. for me, if I don't continue doing makeup and continue working on different faces, I don't know what is needed out there. Yeah. So by using all of these other products that I'm using and working on different skin types, working on different skin tones, people with with any kind of skin concerns, anything, by that I get to know what I can bring to the table because in my what's products. missing, what's yeah. what the, the challenges that yeah. you are facing when doing yeah. the work, you know what's needed in the market yeah. now, which is the the best way to create a business. Exactly. Yeah. So, Bobby, can I'm going to come to you I? very soon. Okay. Yeah, please add. Okay, so <clears throat> back to your question about making multiple Ninas. So we tried this in the UK, mm-hmm. um, and we and I'll be honest, I think we failed at, at it because. Um, so when I when we first got married, um, I before we got married, I never asked Nina how she earned her money or where her money comes from because, as far as I was concerned, her money's her money, my money's my money. Once we get married, married, we'll we'll discuss that. So. Um, I, I asked her how how she's making her money and what her system is, um, and she explained this to me. And she said basically, I'm part of a, uh, a publication, and mm-hmm. and this is how it works, and this is the percentage that they take, and this is how much weight I get after mm-hmm. uh, whatever bookings I get. And I was like, doesn't sound doesn't sound right to me. Yeah. So um, I asked her to call a meeting with the with the two people who own the, the publication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was already working for a bank at the time, so it was after hours. Um, I met Nina there, and I met the other two people there. And it was um, it was a quite a frank discussion around the table. I was um, very you know, muted. <laughs> yeah, was, I thought my career was over. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted justification as to why they were get why they were taking the percentages they were taking for the hard work Nina was doing. So Nina was generating the business. Yeah. Nina was going out and doing the business. And yet she was taking the smallest piece of the pie. Yeah. And um, to that, their answer was, it was, it's like a gesture of goodwill from them to her. And I'm like, but that doesn't make sense. So it was, um, it was quite a blunt conversation from my, from my part because I didn't feel that it was fair with what they were doing with Nina. So um, we walked out of that meeting and she was literally like, what do you just do in there? Because <laughs> where am I now going to? get my business from and I said don't worry about it you know you can't continue doing business in that way where people are you, you're not making the money you know yeah. ultimately you're in business not for fun you know there is a bottom line that you need to yeah. to look at as well so we left that and um, we went away on holiday mm-hmm. and when we came back from holiday that publication sent her an email she came we came back opened her emails and she's like they don't want to work with me anymore <laughs> So she was, it was a Christmas time. I was she, on a contract, like it wasn't a full time. It was more of a free, I, they, I was contracted out by yeah. then, basically. So she was, she literally, she was in tears. She was like, that's it, what do I do? And I said, don't, don't worry about it. So we, we had a look, I said, who are the competitors? Mm-hmm. And um, so she told me who the competitor was. I said, book an appointment, get in touch with them, book an appointment for January. We'll go in together and go and meet them. Yeah. So we were turned up at the competitor and they were like, what are you doing here? Like to both of us. And I said, look, we're open for, for business. Mm-hmm. What can we do together? And then they said, look, this is our proposal. And I said, fine. So we signed an, an agreement, which was, um, it was quite a lot of financial commitment from our part at that time. Mm-hmm. So I said, yeah, fine, we'll do it. So I signed there and then and walked out. And then we walked out and she was like, what have you just done? She was like, we, we haven't even got that much coming in and you've just agreed to this contract yeah. and I said look the business will come in you, like, you just have to have faith so we joined the competitor yeah. and we started working with them at which point um, things took off they took off so really what well. was the, the things to do what were you guys doing so Nina had to do so the when we, makeup services yeah or? when I was with the original publication uh, my bookings my private bookings were my own freelancing that yeah. was my own yeah. but I started teaching so I started doing courses and okay. they were taking a percentage of that because they because felt, they were promoted on the publication. Yes. Okay. So um and and they felt that they deserved an introductory offer. Yeah. Uh, introdu- introductory yeah. Um, fee, right? Yeah. yeah. And um so then from that's what we discussed in the meeting, mm-hmm. and then from there they the, the I kind of knew because of being working in the office that the mm-hmm. magazine wasn't doing so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and then they obviously decided to that, that you know they didn't require me they were going to do everything in-house yeah so that's when we went to the competitor and we signed on as an advertiser with them so we were going to have campaigns with them throughout the entire year. Like a print a campaign yes. for coaching services. For no, teach, just for, for just makeup for services. Her makeup. For makeup services. Yeah. So we okay. left the coaching side as, with that other publication. We, yeah. we left it completely. Okay. So I walked away from that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then we set this up. We agreed to the, the contract and um, we put in the adverts. And then from the back of that, business started coming in. And it was a good, it was a good investment. Yeah. You know, we, we, whatever we put in, uh, we made four times the the okay. amount back so for me it was a good investment and i guess after that year you know nina got to see that hang on a minute you know there are different ways of of doing business you don't have to work with your hands tied behind your back and the main thing i said to her is that look you, they've got you brainwashed to think that you need them and it's not actually that way around it's that they need you yeah so don't mm. don't fall short of of your talent because people are brainwashing you to believe certain things. Yeah. So because of that, we moved away. Um, we moved to the new publication and we had a really good relationship with them for the whole time that we were in the, in the UK. You know? And from the back of that, um, they did an annual bridal show. Mm -hmm. So we continued doing the training alongside Nina's makeup. And, we, you know, um, we built up a team to, to do the runway for this bridal show and we had 14 artists that were trained by Nina mm -hmm. and uh, we created an agency so um, for example like if a bride wanted Nina to do her makeup but then they had additional guests we would then outsource to to the girls yeah. that had been trained by Nina yeah. on the basis that Nina understands the quality of their work and yeah. you know she can vouch for the the work that they're going to do so while we're in the UK it was fine um, and we could oversee that but then it got to a point where these girls that were trained by Nina wanted, they, they thought because they'd been trained by Nina, that overnight they would become a Nina. And they didn't realize that it's taken her 20 years to get where she's got to. Yeah. And they kind of wanted overnight success, you know, very quickly. Yeah. And because of that, the demands that they were trying to put back on us um, were unrealistic. So the, the customer service wasn't there in terms of what Nina would do. Like, for example, how she, she said that she looks the part when she goes to do clients. Yeah. We were getting reports back that, that, you know, they weren't wearing the uniform that we'd asked them to wear. They wouldn't turn up with a fresh face of makeup. Some of these bookings were early mornings. They'd be late, yeah. you know, and we were dealing with customer service issues that we were, it was very difficult for us to control because they weren't on our payroll. So, yeah. and you know, it's affecting so, the brand. Yeah. So if somebody's on your payroll, ultimately they report to you. Whereas when you're contracting out someone, what, you know, they're going to get paid. Yeah. And there is no repercussions and after that other than you stop giving them further bookings. Yeah. So it got to a point where it was like, do we, we balance it out? Does this affect our brand? And do we jeopardize our customer service? Or do we continue making that little bit of extra money because we're offering the service? So we, we, we made a judgment call and I said, it's, it, it's not worth our time and effort because of the customer complaints, the services, you know, it, it just ruins the, the brand image that you've, you've taken years to build. Because the, the bookings were coming through Nina Ubi. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we, we, the contract was between us and the client, not between the yeah. contractor and them. Yeah. So for them, they, they've got nothing to lose. They go up, turn up, do a bad job and walk away. Yeah. And it's our name, our and brand, our yeah. reputation that's going to yeah. gonna um, take the hit. So um, we took a decision that when we left the UK, we kept it going for a little while. We, we reduced the size of the team from 14 girls to six. Um, and we still outsourced it. A little bit of work to the few that we do trust but other than that we've just it, that part of the business was taking too much time and effort mm -hmm. to warrant continuing mm. making more ninas like you asked so for in in that respect you know we have got a few artists that we don't mind recommending um do they work up to the standard of nina no they don't you know we'll be quite honest with that um but i don't think it's something that we can work towards because what the clients want when they expect Nina's work, they want the same thing when they have a mini Nina turn up and that's never gonna happen. Yeah. So we can't please our customers by doing that. Yeah. It's very focused to expertise. It's a very, um, you know, a person, it's the the person is the brand and it's her work. So that's that's where the limitation Correct. is when it mm. comes to this so, kind of business model. So you can't, it's not a scalable business in terms yeah. of, of makeup service services. Not, yeah. You can't, like we've tried it, we've failed because you can't you know 
Nina's an expert at what she does. Yeah. You can't have a, a whole team of experts at that level, you know, yeah. and, and people don't understand that. Yeah. Have you heard about this brand called Shehnaz Hussain in India? There used to be this brand back then. I don't know, not skincare. anymore. Skincare. Yeah, it's yeah. skincare. She was yes. not into makeup at all? It's I don't know skincare. if she was into makeup, but I do remember. It was skincare. Her then. skincare, yeah. Okay. Because then I saw it spreading everywhere. Even internationally, I could find Shehnaz Hussain. The skincare related. was pretty good. I remember using yeah. some of it. Yeah. Because it was authentic Indian, yes. like traditional Indian, yeah. ingredients. Like hole and everything. Yeah. yeah. So that's all. I'm just, uh, when we are talking, I was just thinking about maybe she had a makeup line as well. And everywhere they would do Shehnaz Hussain makeup or Shehnaz Hussain mm. this. And so I, I saw this model kind of, or maybe I, I'm kind of, it's very old. I don't remember very clearly, but I, so it, it, it does have, this business model does have scalability issue because it's one person who's the expert here. Um, how did influence you are you are a social media influencer you have about 300,000 almost 300,000 followers on Instagram you're just about 4,000 away while we are shooting this <laughs> so <laughs> so uh how did that happen um I kind of fell into it I'll be honest um when we moved out to Dubai when was that oh, it's about 2015 both of you came together I yeah came a month earlier Yeah, so I just came, one month. Yeah, right? so I I landed. Um, some friends kindly put me up for a month, um, and during that time I was looking for apartments and places to live. And we were then Nina was getting everything packed up from London, and I was receiving everything here. So we basically moved here. I found an apartment without her even seeing it. <laughs> yeah. so no signed, pressure for yeah, him. So <laughs> signed the agreement, and I got her to ship the boxes from. from London and then I was here basically receiving the boxes and then she turned up a month afterwards opened the boxes and set up our apartment yeah. mm. why did you guys choose Dubai of all the places in the world so Nina had a <laughs> hidden agenda <laughs> uh, so we um, got married in Dubai oh, okay. um, six and a half years ago and then after that um, we really enjoyed coming back so we were back every two three months on on holiday and Uh, we started getting used to the place and looking around, made friends. Um, and then while we were coming on holiday, I was asking questions to the people that we were, we were meeting to see what it's like here and how it works. And um, eventually I, I, I said to Nina that, look, you know, it's the kind of place I wouldn't mind living. I think at that point she, she grabbed... Music to my ears. <laughs> she I, I always, I've always wanted to live here. Uh -huh. And when he said that, I was like... Let's yes. move. <laughs> This so, is it. It's gonna happen. So yeah. So then that was it, really. So then not I. You know, it was a very quick transition. Mm. Um, I initially got offered a, a job in Saudi. Mm -hmm. um, that fell through, and then uh, I then researched into Dubai. Um, I was from a banking background, and then um, got offered a job in financial services here in, in UAE for the first year um, that I was here, um, and. Yeah, then we just, as soon as I knew that I had something here. Because with Nina, with her work, it was, you know, whether she was in London or Dubai, it made no difference. She would yeah. still carry on doing what she was doing. For me, it was, it was quite crucial at that point. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that I, I had something that I'd be going into. Um, it didn't last very long. Uh, to be honest, it lasted a year with what I was doing before I then took the plunge and moved completely from employed to, to self-employed. But yeah, that's when we moved. That was to. a difficult period. I can imagine. Yeah, because now when he decided to do that shift, everything became came basically a lot of pressure on, on you, right? To well, I mean, when he decided to leave, it was because he just felt that it wasn't the financial industry was very different here to what it what he was used to in the UK. Yeah. Um. So it didn't sit well with him in that sense. So um. To be honest, I had wanted him to join me in the business for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Like he obviously, being my husband, he'd help me with certain things. If I ever had any issues, I'd go to him, you know, yeah. for, for advice. So he was always there anyway, but I wanted him to be a lot more hands-on and involved in the business and really kind of make it his own kind of baby as well. Yeah. So um, I'd always known that I wanted to create my own line, my beauty. own beauty line yeah I could have done it many years ago the way that I've seen a lot of people do it which is just private label mm -hmm. you know which is very easy you just create a logo take it to China put it yeah. on some products and boxes and there you go yeah but I didn't want to do it that way because it doesn't have my 
in my DNA yeah. in that product. Yeah. And I didn't, I, I didn't want to create something that wasn't genuinely created by me. And that's where I really wanted Bobby to come on board because he has the experience in from the manufacturing side and, and, and things like that. So I said to him when he left, it, it was a lot of pressure because going back to what Bobby said previously, where we went to this publication and I was like, how have mm. you done that? We don't even know. Yeah. As much as I was doing, as much as I carried my business through for many years before we met, I still knew as a business owner, especially with what I do, your income is never guaranteed yeah. every month. You know, so I wasn't forecasting the way that he now forecasts. You know, for me, it was just month by month, yeah. you know, because I'm not a numbers person. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was like, this is how much I've made this month. Great. And then the next month, oh God, I haven't made this much. What am I going to do? Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. for me, it was like month by month. Whereas now, 12, even 24 months ahead, we, we know what's, what's coming in every month, yeah. you know, and that's down to him. Yeah. But so, so there's that aspect that, he taught me along that, along those ways. And, and he taught me that, you know, you, like you said, you have to take risks sometimes and have a bit of faith that you are able to, to commit and you, you can do it basically. Mm -hmm. um, and with the product side of it, I basically said to him that, look, you know, I really want you to come on board now that you're not gonna be continuing with what, what you were working, uh, who you're working for, you know, either you carry on looking or you can come on board and see how this goes for at least six months to a year. Yeah. And then that's when he said, okay, I'll give it the transitional period was, was, that was, that was, I, <laughs> that was difficult, wasn't yeah. it? So what, oh what, my gosh. What, the, what happened in so that period? I guess, okay, so my background, um, so uh, like, you know, uh, my grandparents were born in India, you know, Indian, my dad was, uh, my dad's passed away now, but he was born in Kenya. Um, as was my mum, and they shifted to the UK. Um, so my dad was in in the UK. He moved when he was thirteen. So his parents split up when he was he was young. So my grandma sent him and his older brother to the UK. Um, um, his older brother was sixteen. He started working. My dad was thirteen, and um, in the UK at that time, because they'd come from Africa, my dad was quarantined, as it as it was called. Yeah. So he wasn't allowed to go straight into school because of infectious diseases. So um, they wouldn't allow him to go, go into school. So he um, he had to hang about for three months, four months. Um, then he ended up getting into college, um, got bullied in college in the UK, again, down to racism. So as soon as they both, like my uncle was working anyway, but as soon as my dad hit 16, he was like, this isn't, I'm not going to hang around here, you know, to be constantly bullied. Um, at that time, he turned up wearing a turban, so he cut his hair so he could fit in. So there's a lot of racial issues back in the UK at that time. Um, he then became, well, he did an uh, engineering apprenticeship um, and then eventually fell into a business with him and his older brother um, into manufacturing rubber and plastics. Um, after they'd set the business up, they then brought in uh, their younger brother mm -hmm. who, and the family came from from uh, India it was at that time. So my dad built a business from scratch. It was one of those stories where he turned up in the UK with five pounds in his pocket and um, basically built his his business, yeah. his businesses um, from nothing. So, you know, growing up, I, you know, ever since I was probably nine, 10 years old, it's been a case of, you know, you have to work, you have to work. So on the weekends, go out, wash the cars, cut the grass, you know, and as a kid, you'd ask for money and it'd be like, this isn't how the world works. So, you know, this is how a family it, works. Yeah. yeah, you do it and you do it because you've got a roof over your head and you get, you know, food on the table. So he did that. And then probably around the age of 13, 14, you know, start getting a bit of pocket money, you know, to go to school. So, you know, it was kind of like hard labor. Yeah. And then at the age of 16, I remember he, um, school holidays was working in his factory, a standard minimum wage. It was like one pound an hour or something like that. You know, you work all week and do all the overtime and you come out with 150 pounds at that time. And it was like, oh my God, you know, I have some money. Um, so it was, it was kind of, um, my background has been like, you have to work hard, you know, nothing's going to get given to you. Um, uh, I, I guess in the background, it, he was kind of grooming me for, for business. 
So um, it was always a case of going to the factory with him, watching, learning, understanding how he speaks to people, how he puts deals together. And I guess the time that I spent with him at that time was invaluable because that's the kind of experience that I'm taking with me yeah. now. So uh, when he passed away at 25, I guess for the next eight years of my life, I, um, I, I was at, we, the business was with my uncles. Um, one of my uncles turned very sour, you know, forced us out of the business. Um, we then ended up, um, I, my dad was building a house at the time I finished building the house. Um, made sure my mom was fine. I had younger siblings, put them through um, whatever education they needed to go through. And then the next eight years was kind of me finding my feet again. Mm -hmm. And then uh, then I met Nina. And at that time I was in banking, but I had a very strong kind of business core um, DNA built into me from yeah. a young age. But because I was working for a bank, you know, I, I was kind of not able to to utilize the experience that I had because I was working for, for somebody else. Yeah, why did you choose to do that? Why didn't you choose to do big business from the beginning? Because, because you have such strong foundations. <clears throat> because of at that time, um, it was such a, an important time financially for us because without- It's safer because, to have a corporate job. Yeah, because my dad was the main uh, breadwinner for the family and all of a sudden he was, he, he'd gone and then we were out, out of the, the family business. So we were basically, I, I forced a buyout from my uncles, mm -hmm. um, which was like a legal battle that took months. And it was it was mainly because of one of my uncles um, mm -hmm. who, who was being very difficult. Um, but eventually when I did get the buyout, we had this lump sum of money, which I couldn't spend because of other commitments we had with the building of the, of the house. Yeah. So it was one of those situations where do I take a risk with no background, no mentor, and put all this money at risk, which means that if it goes wrong, we then lose everything. everything. Yeah. Or do I then start from the bottom and work my way up through a salary job and yeah. hopefully make get it. make ends meet? So that's safer why I, to be yeah. to so I took the safer option. So yeah. I went down the banking route and um, it was uh, it wasn't easy because I, I'd gone from a very well paid job, yeah. you know, living at, at home with my dad, who's, you know, the business was good, you know, if we wanted, if I wanted a car, I'd get a car, holidays, they were there. Um, <clears throat> it went down to probably earning £12,000 a year, mm -hmm. which was a big, big decline in, in what I was used to. But I did it and I worked my way up and I became a director then for the, I moved from HSBC to a different bank, Santander, mm -hmm. and then I became a director. Have some water. Yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then I became a director for the bank. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoyed that journey. You know, I had I had some really strong mentors working for the bank. And I guess a lot of what I do now is also down to them. I, like I have a very close friend, um, Scott, who was my, my mentor when I worked through the bank. And um, he taught me a lot of skills that I know today on Excel, which my dad probably didn't my dad was not he he, he was, was a pen and paper guy <laughs> yeah he, he wasn't he he hated education he said i can't study you know for me give me something to do and i'll do it you know you let me use my hands and i'll do it mm. you know you want me to make anything and i can do it but you ask me to study and read a book and then sit down and recite what i've just read that's not me so i it was weird because once he forced me to go through education. He put us through private school, forced me to go through education. And when I did my last exam for university, I, I said to him, I still remember, I was like, I hated that. I absolutely hated <laughs> education. And uh, he turned around to me and he just laughed and he said, oh, but you had to do it because yeah. he said, you, ha you need this as backup. But he, he said, you're exactly like me. I hate studying. Yeah. You know, give me anything to do with my hands and I'll do it. You yeah. know, ask me to do anything else yeah. and I'll, I'll do it. But studying, I hate. So I've done it and I've got a degree behind me, but um, do I think that a degree is what it takes to become an entrepreneur? I absolutely don't. Because whatever I've learned in my degree, I've used 2% of it yeah. in what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. What I learned from my dad, physically learning on the job. And doing the business. Yeah, yeah. Is, That's uh, where the key learning is in implementation. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess for me, I had, when, we, when I joined Nina, 
it was like, okay, I've got my way of working. Yeah. And Nina's got her way of working. And they're very, very different. <laughs> Yeah. Very different. Um, we're very, we're generally very quite different. Yeah. So Nina's very creative with what she does. You know, as That's a creative, field, yeah. yeah. As a creative, she's brilliant. Um, in terms of her her expertise, I can't knock her. You know, like with her makeup, and you know, I've yeah. seen what she does, and I've seen the talent she's got. For me, my main aim was to try and extract as much of her talent as I could and monetize it. Mm-hmm. So that's what, where I came in. And it was a case of, right, she was doing things. And for her, it kind of made sense because that's how she's always done it. And, you know, she's, she was rocking with it. And I'd, I'd challenge her and I'd be like, why are you doing this? And she's because it's how I've always done it. And I was yeah. like, well, it's not really the right way to do it. And then that's when we clashed. Yeah. And then I guess for the first six months, where we were trying to find our feet as to what I was doing and what Nina was doing, that was hard. I was trying to get synergy, I think. It, yeah. was, it was, that was the hard part because when it came to work for him and work for me, you know, we would go away and do our thing. Yeah. And then home life was great, you know, which is why we got married, you know, because of how we connected. But when it came to business, it was very different, you know, and, and it was the transitional period was hard because obviously exactly what Bobby's just said, that was that was one point. Then it was a case that he was for many years so used to working for a company to now doing his own thing. It's very different, yeah. very. It was, for me, it was, I couldn't even remember the last time I worked for someone. Yeah. You know, so, so it was, because I remember when we first got married, when he was still working for the bank and sometimes I'd have my laptop open in the evening and he, he'd be like, what, why have you got that open now? Like, this isn't the time to work. <laughs> and then and then now we're both sitting there with our laptops open, you know? So, so it's yeah. now it, it, we've got to the point, we've overcome all of that and we've got to the point where we, we are both well aware of what we need to put in and why we need to put what we put in. Yeah. So, that, plus, I think at that time, nobody understood, you know, we moved to Dubai and that initial, I think that was a, a big shock for our families. Yeah. And then on top of that, I've then had to go back and say, right, and now I've stopped doing what I'm doing. And I'm now working yeah. here. And then it's a case of, right, so what are you going to do? Even even to this day, I still get questions. So what is it that you do then? So mm. so people don't understand that we have got our own responsibilities. responsibilities. And I can't function without Nina. And now Nina's got to a point where she can't function without me. Like The other day she had asked me, she was like, look, there's certain things that you do. If anything ever happened to you, how am I going to pick up the pieces? Yeah. You know, how, I, like, I need to know, like, how to do things that you do because otherwise our business will not carry on moving forward. Yeah. So this is, I think, the kind of thing now, like three years into it, even to this day, you know, the questions come up. You know, I think my family have a, has a perception of Nina with what she does. Her family has a perception of, of me and what I do. And the actual reality is that both sides are completely wrong. You know, they don't have, I would say, 5% of a clue of what, what goes on and, and how we work. And there is constant growth on your mind. There's constant battles that you're fighting every day. You know, business isn't easy. It's not, um, it's not for the lighthearted, I would say. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be very strong and you have to have very thick skin. Um, you have great days. Um, but yeah, equally, you have very bad, bad days. Very bad days. We're yeah. Sleepless nights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, on, on, and yes. you know, the great days, you forget. You, you have a great day today, tomorrow, you've forgotten about it. You have a bad day, you'll yeah. remember that for a week, for yeah. a month. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's one of those things where it you've got to take the rough with the smooth, and it is hard, you know. And now I think that there's this fad of being an entrepreneur. You know, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. It's great, but there's a lot of hard work that goes behind it. There's a lot of sacrifices, you know, there's time that you've got to sacrifice, holidays that you've got to sacrifice. You know, the the luxuries that you were probably used to before when you're on a set income, you've got to forget those because you've got now forecasting. You know, you may have a great month, but then your bad month is going to eat into your great month. So it actually wasn't that great, you know, as great as you thought it was. You've got fixed costs. You know, especially moving to Dubai, setting a business up here is very different to setting a business up mm. in the UK. In the UK, you pay two hundred pounds to company's house, get an accountant, and you're you're going. You know, you don't have to have like here. You have to 
make sure if you've got an LLC company, you've got your your DED fees, yeah. you've got your tenancy, you've got your local sponsor. Yeah. You know, then you've got to make sure that you abide by the FTA. So make sure that you've got TRN now for your yeah for the your bad returns. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot that goes into it. You know, there's certain activities that you have to make sure that your company fits into. Otherwise, if you don't, you have to get another trade license. You know, there's so much more that goes into it here than anywhere else. Than in anywhere the world. else. Yeah. And I guess that's where I come in. So I've said to Nina, look, you don't worry about what I do. I mean, let me take care of the, the that kind of stuff. You know, I'll make sure that that's right. That I'll make sure that everything else, the operational side of our business is right. Our strategy is right. Our growth is right. You carry on doing what you're great at. Mm-hmm. And that's the creative side. That's the influencer side, the PR side. So she deals with all the PR. She mm-hmm. deals with all the influencer side. She does all the, the makeup bookings, you know, the dealing with the clients. So she's great at that. So we, we let that go, but that's not scalable, which is where the product line has come in. Okay. Because that is now part of the business which we can scale up. Yeah. And that's what we can grow as a company. So we've yeah. got all these other aspects that bring in income. Yeah. But for us, even though at the moment, gross profit looks great, but everyone knows in the first three years, three to five years of business, you're, you look at your net profit, you're always going to be at a loss yeah. when, you, when you're start, starting off. But again, as an entrepreneur, people don't understand that. They think you get up, you start a business, year one, you know, you'll be sitting in a profit. Most of the time you won't, it'll be a loss. Yeah, because the reality it, hits when you start. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess, yeah. you know, that's where I try and shelter a lot of the stuff from her in terms of what's going on, what's the forecasting, you know, yeah. what we communicate as to like, okay, this month is going to be great. This month isn't looking so good. Then here in Dubai, you've got Ramadan, mm. you know, one month of the year where it's very quiet. And yeah. then summer period where everybody... It's very hot, people travel. Hot, travel, yeah. and, and, you know, then you've got a very quiet period. So you need to make sure that your business rides that wave. Yeah. And then it picks back up again. Yeah. So there's the summer months where you start thinking, oh my God, our business is going to go bankrupt. Shall we just pack up? Shall we leave? <laughs> the, yeah, there's, there, there, there are those days as well. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so this is, I think for us, that's the kind of where I... I you know, if you, if you want to know what I do and what Nina does, that's yeah. probably the easiest way to split it, right? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think we both understand what our roles are. And, yeah. and if we didn't talk about what each other do, then we wouldn't be able to work together. So, yeah. it, you know, it's not so much a case that I have no idea, you know, he hides stuff from me or I hide stuff. We both understand what yeah. we do. And I think we are lucky in the sense that, because I don't think it's often that you will find husband and wife able to work with each other exactly. as well so, as live with each other. Yeah. And I have to say that that I think we we do that pretty well. Yeah, we, we, we have had our transitional period, don't get me wrong. And we have our day, we've had our days where we have threatened each other that that's it, you know what? <laughs> this is, I'm no longer doing this with you. You know, we've had those days, it's yeah. normal. It's yeah. natural, it happens. But if you don't do that, you're not getting it off your chest. You're not moving forward. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? So, so we, we believe in being completely upfront with each other. Sometimes we still, we've definitely got a lot better, but yeah. sometimes we still have those days, but we've learned that there's a there's a way to deal with it when it's work related. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it, it's hard. We, we do, it's not like we're with each other 24 seven, although it- No, kind of, it's not that. And I guess, you know, we have arguments for work. They're, I wouldn't call it arguments, they're disagreements. And yeah. most of the time, I'll be honest, it, it's probably instigated by myself, you know, because I don't really You've got have this on a, camera now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really have a, a way with words. I'm, I'm quite blunt when it comes to... For me, it's we've got an agenda. Let me just get to the point. You know, I'm not going to mince my words. This is basically the problem. And I think you are causing the problem. You know, Whereas or, I'm a bit more emotional. I'm like, how could you possibly say that to me? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where I think then it, it's a case of, look, it is for work. Ultimately, this is for the benefit of the business. So let's take emotions out of it. There is a problem. We need to solve this. How are we going to solve this? And and it's, you know, two heads are always better than one. Yeah. I can't do this on my own. So <laughs> it's it started then at six o'clock, seven o'clock, whenever we d- decide to down tools, it's a case of, right, okay, now it's home home life. So, so we you, are... You can separate that. We never used to be able to. to. Yeah, we used to carry our work life into home life. Naturally, uh, that'll happen. That's yeah. because when you work together, that's what happens. And then we, we got to a point where we're like, we need to draw a line because ultimately <coughs> we are husband and wife first. 
before yeah. we became business partners. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we've got us as business partners and then us as husband and wife. And and personally, there's no issues. You know, like if, if you've got no issues personally at home, like if I had to <coughs> somebody at work at the office where I was working, I wouldn't come home and necessarily take them out on my wife. Yeah. So we've got to understand that now we, we need to separate. So there have been times where we probably haven't spoken all day because we've had a disagreement for mm -hmm. work. And then it's seven o'clock and I'm like, we'll go to each other. We're like, but ultimately your husband and wife. <laughs> we have to yeah. remind each other. <laughs> so, but again, it's it's one of those things that comes with, with business. Yeah. You know, it's, it's I, I would say it's great, you know, and I, I'm a big believer of building my own dream rather than someone else's. You know, you work 40 hours a week. You know, they always say this, you work 40 hours a week for someone else. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, you'll work 80 hours a week for yourself and, and earn nothing out of it. But yeah. I would still do the 80 hours a week. You know, give me the chance. Why would I want to go and ask somebody now when I can have my lunch break or when I can go on holiday? I don't want to ask that. So for me, I, I like the advantages of, of having my own business and my own time. Time is probably the most valuable asset to me. Yeah. You know, uh, how I manage my time. You know, I'm, I don't believe in this culture of being busy. I think it's, I think it's um, you know, I'm not going to swear, but BS. You know, I think people think that they're busy. There's a big difference between being busy and being productive. You know, if you're going to, if you're busy, and what you're doing is productive, great, do it. But if you're trying to fill eight hours of your day pretending that you're busy because you're sat at your laptop and you're not actually being productive, that's a waste of eight hours. So don't do it, you know? So I guess for me, it's a case of, right, I, know I, I always analyze the week or the day and I'll say to her, how was your day? Well, have you had a productive day? You know, it's that sort of language that we have, you know? I don't wanna know if you've had a busy day because yeah. that's rubbish. How was your day? Was it productive? How was your week? Was that productive? You know, was the meeting productive? Otherwise, don't do it. If, it. if it's not productive, don't do it. It's a waste of your time. It's not going to like, add any value to yeah. the business. And I guess the other thing is that we now look at everything as a return on investment. You know, any money that you spend, what's going to be the return on investment on that? Mm -hmm. you know, even down to, let's say, a simple iPhone. You know, mm -hmm. you buy an iPhone, $1,000, what's going to be the return on that as an investment? You know, there's no point in having the latest iPhone for the sake of spending a thousand dollars when I can put a thousand dollars into Google ads, Yeah, you know? So you start looking at things differently. Yeah. So we don't have the latest iPhones because we don't need them. That, that money goes into other parts of the business, which will generate a return on income. Yeah. You know, I look at assets as a way of bringing in income and liabilities as a way of sucking money out. Yeah. For me, it's a case of building my assets rather than increasing my liabilities. No point in having a great car, which is a, and technically it's a depreciating asset. Yeah. You know, you can, you can put 100,000 dirhams into a car, three years time, it's going to be worth 50,000 dirhams. Or I can put 100,000 dirhams into a product and generate 400,000 dirhams off the back of it. Yeah. So for me, that, that's where I look at how I'm generating the business, how I'm making things grow. So we have had to cut back on, on a lot of things where I don't think my mindset was actually necessarily right because I had the security of my father behind me because even if I did lose money or I did have a depreciating asset, I had the comfort knowing that money Through was gonna come from the dad. Yeah. yeah. Whereas now I don't I that that thinking has completely gone. So I look at things very differently. And I guess for me that's been my education piece towards Nina to try and get her to also come on that journey with me, which thankfully she has done. You know, she's been a real great supporter of that that journey that I'm trying to take us both on. Yeah, you've answered so many of my questions that were in future, but uh, let's come to mink lashes. Why did you guys choose to launch a product line just with lashes? You could have chosen any makeup, any, there's so much range to pick from to launch a product. Why lashes? Um, for me, it's something that I use on, I'd say 99% of my bookings. It's something that I always have to use on my clients. And before we launched the lashes, I was obviously using um, competitor lashes. Yeah. And one thing I realized was that people weren't necessarily always happy with the lashes, you know? And I, I used to keep a, a, a big variety of lashes on me because you have to, you, don't, you never know yeah. what kind of style the person wants. Yeah. And 
I'd either have to cut them, trim them so that they're not as long, or I'd have to layer them, or you know they were uncomfortable and I couldn't apply it to the to the whole lash, mm -hmm. you know. So I'd have to trim it so it was only a quarter. Um, and these are things that I kind of realized that that there wasn't a lash out there that that kind of ticked all the boxes, mm -hmm. you know. And so, so for me, I started designing lashes and I said to Bobby that this is what I want to do. I want to start with lashes because it's something that I love. I always wear without, I've always got a pair of lashes on and I always use them on my clients. And I really wanted to just have a product which I know I can just take out of the box and use it and it's right. Yeah. You know, it's the right one. It's not, there's not anything missing from it. So I started designing the lashes myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was it was probably a two year process in terms of in the making of it, mm -hmm. um, because it was a case of obviously sending it back to the man like the manufacturer and then like making sure the changes were made and then they'd get sent back and then it was there's further changes or it's not right. Mm -hmm. It's such a long process in that sense. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was ensure that they were comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that the band was super thin, but at mm -hmm. the same time that then poses a struggle of making sure that you can have a good volume lash because yeah. your base needs to be strong to hold the number of hairs. Yeah. So that was something that was, we had all these obstacles along the way that I wanted to make sure that I had the lash that I want. I want a thin band. I want it to be comfortable. I want them to look natural. Mm -hmm. I want all these things, but then having to, to, to being able to create a product that has all these things and that it is good quality yeah. is another thing. Yeah. So that was that's why it took so long as well. So I made sure I ticked all those boxes. So now we had the lash, which mm -hmm. was really comfortable on the eye. You only had to trim it. You you have to trim it if your eye shape is smaller. That's it. Um, you can trim it if you want to just keep it as a corner lash. Uh, it has good volume, but it doesn't feel heavy on the eye. It doesn't have, it, there's nothing that kind of digs into your inner eye, which is normally the complaint that I used to get from clients. Um, and it just feels like they're not wearing any lashes. Mm -hmm. So I had all of that, but then I thought, I don't, that isn't enough for me. I, I'm ticking all the boxes, but how is my product gonna start, stand out from everyone else? Yeah. So one thing that I realized when I was designing them, that I was obviously wearing them myself to test them, as well as using them on some of my loyal clients. And I realized that I really loved the look of them without wearing any makeup with them. Mm -hmm. And that was another question I always used to get from my clients. How can I create a smoky eye? But I, I haven't got the time to do, to spend like you do, because it's your job, yeah. you know? So how do I create a quick smoky eye? Or how can I make, make, you know, how do I create this look or that look? How do I create a winged liner? So I thought, how can I answer all of these problems with my lashes? So I designed lashes that there are a few of the bra few of the the lashes like Savannah. That's mm -hmm. one lash that we have. If you put that on without any eye makeup, it gives the illusion of a full smoky eye. Okay. If you put on the lashes Sienna, it gives the illusion of a winged liner, but you've got no eyeliner on. Okay. If you put the lashes called Amelia on, it gives the illusion of a smoky lash line. So that's where I felt like right now I've now I've brought something else to the table because now I feel like mine can be a real competitor because I I am giving them something that they're not able to get from any other lash yeah but your price range I, I don't wear lashes and I don't really put much makeup as well as you can see but um, uh, I was just looking on different lashes I actually googled there was a question on there is a question on that like say for example your competitor Huda Beauty lashes they are they have different price ranges they range from 70 dirhams to 110 to more I don't know and in your case everything you've priced at 110 $29 sorry 29 point something that's 30 around the 30 dollars why is it why have you chosen to keep the same price range so we have two collections we have the mink collection mm -hmm. and that is obviously slightly more expensive Oh, is it? And the classic collection yeah. is uh, another collection that we have, which is natural hair. And the difference between both, and then Bobby will, will discuss the pricing with you, but the difference between both collections is that the mink collection is a luxury lash. Um, they are both luxury lashes, but the mink collection is, it's mink, you know? So it's, you get that real soft, fluffy kind of feeling to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it just looks like your natural lashes, but enhanced. Mm -hmm. So no matter what angle you look from, it's never harsh looking. It's always softening to the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the classic lashes, they're natural hair and they mimic 
your natural lashes. So all it is, is an enhancement. So I always say that the classic collection is for the woman who loves the no makeup makeup look. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to look like you're really wearing lashes, but you want it to just be something there, like something to enhance your eyes, then you go for the classic collection. If you want to go just a step up and kind of really take it a notch up with the with the glamorous side, then you go for the mink lashes. So the if mink lashes like, are more expensive. The mink lashes are more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So when we came to looking at the pricing for the products, mm -hmm. um, I obviously have no sort of cosmetic background yeah. so everything that Nina's just discussed with you was her forte so she did all of that and then basically she brought the the collection to me and said right this is basically the collection that I've approved um now it's the next step of of taking it to market so back when we first started so I basically started dissecting the business you know how are things done you know the first thing we started was with the website you know completely mm -hmm. gutted the website we got a web designer involved um we then and like you know like nina said earlier we don't have a team but we outsource so we got yeah. a copywriter involved so we did an interview with them we got a brand branding company involved we, we completely rebranded us and so there, there was a process that i wanted to go through to make sure that we don't just look like a homegrown kind mm -hmm. of brand you know that even though there is only two of us and we outsource to different companies yeah. It still should look like it's a reputable organization that when you do go to luxury department stores or retailers yeah. that we have have sort of some sort of backing behind us to to wait behind us to go in and then pitch our products. So we did all of this legwork behind the scenes. It was it, it had been going on. So I was doing all of that while Nina was basically looking at the the, the cosmetics. And then it came to the packaging. We had that design, you know. It and then it came to the price point. And having looked at what our competitors were pricing, like I know what the margins are. And I, I look at people like Huda and she, she's able to command a, a huge, um, huge price tag on her products because of the power of her brand behind her. You know, Huda is huge. So whether it's 100 dirhams or 150 dirhams, because it's a Huda lash, people will pay 150 dirhams. You know, whether that lash cost 10 dirhams to make or 100 dirhams to make it makes no difference to the consumer because it's a huda huda lash yeah it's the same thing as buying a rolls royce or a ferrari you know you've got the power of the brand behind you yeah so for us if you take um the car industry as an example we are a new entrant into a, a field where people have got years of industry experience and, and the power of their brands behind them so i needed to make sure that when we pitch our our price it has to be realistic enough for us to enough of a margin for us to make a profit uh, but also not so expensive that it turns consumers away so we did a, a price study against our competitors and i think where we pitched our our pricing was pretty much bang on you know in terms of it, it's not it's a luxury product if you look at our packaging it's a luxury product so the, the mink is actually a luxury lash in, in luxury packaging and it looks the part as well. It's not in, it's not a typical box that's just been branded with our logo from, from mm -hmm. China and brought in, you know. We went through quite an extensive process to do that. But I know by doing that, it's reduced our margins because, because of the cost of packaging, the cost mm -hmm. of the product. So our strategy is basically looking at long-term growth rather than short-term profit because lashes are a fast moving consumer good they're going to be selling in volumes. Yeah. So my main aim is to build the business up to the point where we've got a distribution network where we've got fast moving high volumes, which will then take care of the profit rather than trying to enter the market at such a high price yeah. and not shift as many products, but then capitalize on the, on the profit. So in long-term growth, I think we, we then took a hit on, on the, on the profit that we could make. Um, and I guess it was a it was a gamble that we took, yeah. Um, with the packaging and with the products, and we launched in uh, June twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. Um, and initially upon launch, we sent out our products to all the retailers, and by August, we'd secured a deal to get into Bloomingdale's yeah. to buy more Harvey Nichols, more of Emirates, and online at unas com. And then off the back of that, so we did a three month exclusivity period with them. But during that time, we were getting knocked 
on the door for, by other um, retailers. Um, and we grew. We got, uh, we're in Triano in Abu Dhabi. We're mm -hmm. in uh, Bloomingdale's in Kuwait in 360 Mall. We've now gone into Saks Fifth Avenue in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Faces in Mall of Emirates, Faces in Ras Al Khaimah. Mm -hmm. um, we're in Arige, um, and we, we're going on to further online platforms and, and yeah. we've got other retailers that we're looking to move. So uh, I guess for us, the, the, the price point, you know, whenever we've been to a retailer, it's not something that's going to agitate a customer. You know, they're not going to look at it and, and wonder why the price is where it is because it's, it's kind of the, the midpoint between yeah. like the hood of prices and yeah. our other so competitors. You just chose to be yeah. in so the it's, center. Yeah. So it's more affordable. It's yeah. yeah, I think especially being a woman who has bought makeup and so much of it previously for many yeah. years, it's something that I wanted to make sure as well that it's something that I would buy. Yeah. And I wouldn't look at and think that's a bit expensive, you, you yeah. know. So it's there are so many different factors in in deciding what the price point should be. And obviously a lot of it is down to like what Bobby was discussing, but it's also about having that genuine consumer understanding that yeah. Is this something that I would genuinely pay for? Yeah. Obviously, Bobby's not going to be able to answer that question, you know, yeah. but, but I I can. So yeah. it, it is. I feel comfortable knowing that there's a product out there. I know it's good quality. It looks luxurious. It doesn't look like it's just private label. You know, yeah. there's so much that's been put into the branding side of it. It's it. I can honestly say that that product has our DNA on it. Yeah. Because not just the product, but the branding as well. That that all the colors you see that's us it's not just me it's us that's why you have a slight masculine feel to the to the box because that's where bobby comes in so yeah. it's we've really thoroughly gone through the whole branding process yeah. for it as well it's a new product it's absolutely different from what you were otherwise had got the background of like with the uh, beauty magazine and working with all these brands you knew the makeup products but lashes designing the lashes, getting all these things, getting into these Bloomingdale's and all these luxury stores. I'm sure there must be so many challenges to get them open the doors because and they have all the, your competition already in there. Yeah, mm. with Bloomingdale's, the buyer actually said that she was presented with 50 brands. So, so there's one, you know, we were picked one out of 50. And, and speaking to her and ask, you know, after, like initially I didn't obviously ask, but afterwards I said to her, like, why, why did you pick our product over the other? And she said, because we we have a, what she said, one, obviously the product was great. We loved the product. We tried it, we tested it. But then she said that we have like a table in, in the office where we, we spread all the, the, the products, products out. Yeah. And then we ask everybody in the building to come in and, and select which one they they would personally go out and buy. And everybody moved towards our product. It was the first product they wanted to pick up because of the the look, feel, the quality of the product. Yeah. So yeah, we you know there are challenges, and, and it's it's a big learning curve for me as well because from going from a manufacturing industry, which was where my father was, to now an industry where I'm I'm dealing with retailers. Yeah, you have to look at the margins that they they want as well. You know, so how am I going to make a profit by giving right. them the margins that they're asking? Yeah. So there's tough negotiations to start with and getting my head around, okay, fine, this is, you know, how much we're selling out with them. Yeah. Um, it's it's not an easy industry, you know, it's it's a difficult sure. industry and you, you need to have done your homework and get your maths right before yeah. you, you go into it. Because yeah. if you want to make a profit long term and you want to grow your business, you need to understand where you're going with it. And, and unless you have that sort of understanding initially, you know, there are going to be times where you take a hit on, on certain agreements and deals that you make with the anticipation that your business will grow off the back of it. So it's a risk. Yeah. Business is always, entrepreneurship yeah. is, entrepreneurship is. So there's risk. certain deals yeah. that I've done at, at margins that I wasn't really happy to, to shake hands on, but I did. And those have opened further doors, you know, opened yeah. more doors for me. Mm. So, you know, that was a calculated risk, which I took. Okay, fine. You know, I'm not going to make a loss on, on what I'm doing, but I'm not making the margins that I'm making. But off the back of that, and I, I have three more customers. So it has paid for itself. But it's, it, again, it's just, it is those calculated risks that you need to take. You know, you, you especially here in Dubai, you know, the banking system is such that if you're self-employed, to go and get out a loan now is very difficult. Business loans aren't easy to come by in Dubai. Yeah. And, you know, the, the 
the result of you know any sort of default payments is is quite severe. severe. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. it's not in the UK. You miss three payments. You know. Okay. Yeah. You probably get somebody knocking on your door asking for a bit of money. Here, you miss what you know. You bounce one check, and you, if it's the wrong person that you bounced it with, you're going to end up in in prison. Yeah. So it's not the kind of country where you can afford to take the kind of risks that you probably would do elsewhere yeah. by having credit behind you from a bank because you yeah. don't pay that loan, you, you know, you're in trouble. So everything that we do is self-funded. Mm-hmm. You know, we work, we earn our money and we invest our money that we earn. We have no loans. And that's something that I'm quite proud of. You know, yeah. we're, we're building a business on, on self-funding. Yeah. You know, we started off with so whatever. So much free of my mind is so yeah. free from all the burden of debt. And we started off with whatever money we had, you know. So we're using the money that we've got to make more money rather than using the bank's money to to make more money. And don't, don't get It's me wrong. It's a different mindset. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I have other businesses where I do use bank's money to yeah. make money. But... I know that the percentage that the bank are charging me and the percentage that I'm making, you know, it, it warrants it. And I, I know that I've yeah. got, pay, you know, a system in place to, to make those payments, yeah. even if I don't get other payments in. But this kind yeah. of business doesn't work on, yeah. on that basis. Like a real estate loan would be uh, about 3% to 4%, Correct. whereas a, pers- uh, a company loan would be at 11%. It starts at 11% yeah. interest. So, yeah. And then you try and justify, you know, what sort of growth you need to make, what sort of profits yeah. you need to make to then pay that loan off at that rate. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. So yeah. real estate, I'm all I'm all for it. You know, yeah. so I, I do have real estate business and I do take loans on that. But I know my loans are at three yeah. percent. I know the returns are what you know, yeah. the returns that I'm getting back are more than enough to pay the loan and leave yeah. me with profit. So yeah. That I like, so I don't want to be classed as somebody who hates taking loans. I'll take loans where I, I think yeah. they warrant. But for this, this is all a self-funded project. Yeah. I want to come back to the influencer question because I think we move from there to something <laughs> else. And you answered quite a bit of my questions, which was uh, supposed to be with Bobby. So I want to go back to how the influencer bit happened. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I kind of fell into it um, when we moved out here. In the UK, there's there wasn't at that point anything like influencers or anything like that. Um, I had my Instagram. I used to put some work on there in terms of my makeup clients and everything um and then out here i decided to start blogging yeah so um i have since then never stopped a blog has gone out maximum three times a week minimum twice a week Mm -hmm. without fail and my blog blog is purely about product reviews so it's about products that i've tried uh new products that are out whether i think that they're worth it Mm -hmm. you know swatches everything tutorials everything you can think of and it's all on my website so I started doing that and then I started getting invites to, um, you know, events and everything. And that's when it just kind of, it was just like a snowball. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's when eventually I was like, okay, so I'm obviously classed as an influencer out here yeah. now. Um, I then got approached by ITP, which is the region's biggest influencer agency. They also are the publishing house for Harper's Bazaar, um, Grazia. Yeah. Uh, to name a few um and they manage me now so um okay. i'm managed by them in terms of the influencer side it, that's how it kind of came about and yeah. i guess it was just really a case of me showcasing what i'm really passionate about and people just rest, liking rest it. Broke it in yeah they started following yeah they started following and is then there I, a particular I, sorry to interrupt it's is fine there a particular uh thing that you did that got you more followers like if somebody wants to become an influencer anything any I think tip? for me it was it was being consistent With honestly that's the biggest thing when it yeah. comes to Instagram is the consistency yeah. it's really it's it's a job in itself yeah. I'll be honest I mean job, yeah. the stress that it has given me sometimes because mm-hmm. I have all of this to deal with in terms of the business side and don't get me wrong but Instagram is such a huge part of my business yeah. as well that's where the message spreads yes that's, that's the PR yeah. that Bobby was talking about yeah and I can't not do it you know so yeah. so as much as it is very stressful and it takes a lot of time because equally i can't just post anything it's got to be it's got to be relevant and worth yeah the, it, it time, has, the, the biggest thing it, it has to be relevant because if yeah. my if my people following me don't if if they don't see any kind of relevance in it it doesn't make sense yeah. you know so for me i've it's all about makeup it's about skincare it's about travel and that's because with the traveling with all the destination brides we do we're traveling more or less 
Sometimes it's every month, sometimes mm -hmm. it's every two months where I'm flying to a different destination. Mm -hmm. So I've incorporated all of that into my Instagram so that it adds that personal touch because they also wanna see who you are. Yeah. You know? So yeah, it, it that's how it kind of like came about and yeah. it kind of went from there. And now I just make sure that it kind of stays consistent. Yeah. So being an in, uh, Instagram influencer, I'm sure you are uh, always treated with amazing freebies from different yeah. brands and stuff. Has it ever happened that um, you've got an uh, you've you've got a collaboration opportunity which is not with your values or ethos? Like a brand approaches you and. It's not something that you would, but then they are offering you good. Have you ever come across such situations and how would you deal, how did you deal with that? Yes, I have. Uh, you get many. And firstly, answering the freebie question. Yes, that the, I don't even remember the last time I had to buy any makeup. I'll be completely honest. Yeah. I kind of missed that side, but I'm not going to complain about it because yeah. it saves so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ev literally every day there are deliveries. If we've been away, by the time we get back after a couple of days, there's like a pile box of waiting. boxes waiting. And it's great. I love it and I appreciate it so much. Equally, it's so time consuming because I can't just open it and put it away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's so important. I, I really value and appreciate the fact that these brands are sending it to me. Yeah. So for me, I really want to give them something back by showing people who follow me that, look, this is what I received. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like. You know, sometimes people don't want to buy things because they don't know what it's going to really look like. Yeah. And that's where they come to someone like me because they get to see right, what, you know, how, how is it? Is it worth me buying it? Let me see what it yeah. looks like on you because I've kind of got similar skin tone to you or I'm kind of your, I mean, yeah. mainly the reason they follow me is because they like my work. Yeah. That's the main reason. They either like my makeup or they they uh, kind of feel that there's some kind of connection there in some way or they feel warm to me in some way, you yeah. know? So there is a reason that that's there that they're gonna maybe buy something. Mm -hmm. So, um. For me, yeah, it, the freebie side of it is great. Um, but equally, now that we have a brand of our own, I appreciate it to a whole new level. <laughs> like before I was receiving products and press kits and I loved it and it was great. But now I have a completely different kind of appreciation for it because we've put press kits together ourselves, and the money that goes into it. Yeah. When you send a press kit out, you just hope for the best that that influencer is gonna give you coverage. And I just think it is extremely rude to not give coverage if that person has, if that brand has sent me something. But then so what even if you don't if, relate to the brand? Even if I don't relate to it, I will always say thank you, thank you for sending this to me and put it on my Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. If I feel that, okay, it's something that I love and I would go out and buy myself, yeah, you'll see me swatching it, you'll see me using it. But mm -hmm. I think the least that I could do is just say thank you because I know that that brand, maybe a small brand, but yeah. it takes, a, it's cost them something to send it out to me. Yeah. You know, so for me, I, I think it's just generally being courteous. You should still say thank you. So that's what I do. So even if they are brands that maybe I don't use, I mean, I never really get anything which is, uh, how can I put it? Anything that is kind of makes me think, oh, I don't even want to show this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I've never been in that position, but. I, if I've got collaborations come through like paid social media bookings where the brand has said, we want you to use this product. This is how much you're gonna get paid. If it's something that I genuinely wouldn't use and there have been many, I won't do it mm -hmm. because it, it's not that important to me. You know, it isn't just about the money. That is an important aspect of any entrepreneur in any business, yeah. but it doesn't mean that it, that that's, you have to have, it has to be genuine. So if it's something that I genuinely would yeah. use or I would love to use, then I will showcase it and I'll take that booking on. But if it's something that I feel that I would never, mm. it's just not me. You know, yeah. at the same time I have however many people following me and the ones who are who are loyal people who follow me, they know me as well. They know my personality. Yeah. They know, hold on, that's not you. So you, we know that is yeah. you doing it for the money. Plus it's a responsibility. You have all these fans yeah. who are looking up to you, to what you do, what you suggest and recommend, and you're gonna, gonna you, you want to keep their trust. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's Otherwise, important. why would they believe me in anything yeah. else? Yeah. So if for um, one of the other questions I wanted to ask is, what if a small business owner wants to work or wants to try influencer marketing? 
uh, what would be the best route you would suggest? It, should they now? There's another concept called micro influencers and macro influencers. Micros are these small influencers who have a following of say a thousand, two thousand, under five thousand, and they have they have their own friends and family network, which is so strong and which is mm-hmm. even when they share, they kind of impact. If people buy, but then that's smaller scale, and then there are these macro influencers like yourself who are about hundred thousand. So, if a small business owner wants to invest in influencer marketing, what are the aspects they should look at, and what kind of budgets or spend uh, should they look at as well? Because you are into influencer, I'm sure you have a network. I'm sure you know how, how other influencers work. This is why I'm putting this question across, so you'll have an industry idea that people can look into. Honestly, when it comes to influencers, I feel like it's it's not if 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 a company is going out wanting to get an influencer to use their products and they go it's a paid booking, then I think it's not just about sending the product over to them and putting a price tag on what they're going to get paid. I think there has to be some kind of story element to it. Like if a brand comes to me and says, "Right, this is a product. This is what we're going to pay you. Here's the product, and we want you to do a post." Sometimes this is what happens where they just say, we want to post and we want 10 stories. That's yeah. it. But what I don't agree with is you don't know what post I'm going to do. You don't, I think it needs yeah. to be, they need to be a lot more hands-on with the influencer. Put together a mood board or a storyboard, give that to the influencer and say, right, okay, this is what we're going for because this matches our company ethos. This matches yeah. our our signature style. And we want that to be reflected in your post. I think there needs to be a lot more hands-on. Uh, but then if, um, okay, this is a small business owner. That's if you want to work with one influencer, if you have 10 influencers to work with and everybody has their own style, that's a lot. This is like a marketing on its own. Mm, I, I know. It's hard it, work. It's, <laughs> it's, it's hard. It is difficult. It's when it comes to like the spend, it really is down to who the influencer is, what their engagement is like, you know, yeah. what, what what kind of return you think you're going to be getting, what return you want, to be honest, mm. from it. it. There's so much research that needs to be done in terms of what kind of influencer you're going what with. What returns can you expect? It's with different. It's post, different with each one. Do? Like, for, for example, the people who follow me are not, if you compare me compared to Huda Beauty, Huda Beauty's followers are 100% fans like they are fangirls they will go where she is you know if she says she's doing an appearance they're going to go there because they're like fangirls who are going crazy over her yeah whereas if i do a store appearance it's not going to attract that amount one i'm not anywhere near her in terms of my numbers two the people who follow me are not fangirls the people who follow me are people who want to learn who want to who, who are looking to actually learn something from the tutorials i'm doing who don't necessarily fangirl over me. Mm-hmm. Do, do you see what I mean? So yeah. every influencer is going to have a different type of return for yeah. whatever business it is. And I think you need to just research a bit into that influencer in terms of what their audience is like. How do they engage with their audience? What what what, what are their audience even getting from them? Mm-hmm. You know, so with every influencer, it's completely different. With yeah. mine, I get so many saves on my pictures because they're saving it because they want to go back and see right, when I do this tutorial myself, yeah. how can I do it? With another influencer, it's going to be that maybe people are just going crazy over her just because they're getting really, it's like a huge kind of celebrity crush style thing going on, you know? With me, it's not necessarily like that. So it's more informative on my side, I think. Plus, I think if if I break it down, so with social media marketing, with with the influencer marketing, there's two types of deals. So you've got your paid collaborations and you've got your barter deals. So your barter deal is basically, I will give you X in return for Y. So yeah. basically, you know, you can come and eat at my restaurant. Um, I'll, I'll basically, you can order whatever you like. And in return for that, please can come in and put it on your stories. So you, yeah. you get those types of deals. So again, we would only ever partake in deals like that if we actually enjoy going to t- those types of restaurants. Mm-hmm. And because there's no point. Because your, your, your viewers, your fans, they will see straight through it. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are places that we frequent in Dubai, which they... You know, we don't even ask for a bar to deal. We'll turn up, but because we actually enjoy going to those restaurants, Nina will then put it on her mm-hmm. social media. Yeah. And then as a result of that, they will turn around to us and, and they'll probably realize that she's there. And, you know, yeah. then they'll come to us and say, look, don't worry about, you know, you've already given us coverage on your on your social media. Don't worry about the bill for the, for the meal. So it's not even that we expect it. 
Yeah. So there, there's those types of deals. And then there's the deals that are paid. Now, about two years ago, Dubai um, regulated the, the social media mm, influencer yeah. field. So you now, if you are going to be taking on paid collaboration, you have to have a, a license. Even if you the, receive products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a license by the NMC. So mm -hmm. the National Media Council have basically said that you, you need to be licensed to be an influencer okay. in Dubai. So they're trying to regulate the market, which is a good thing. So um, either you can be private and you have your own private license or you work with an agency and the agency has the license, which then make sure that you are covered as an influencer. So by being a part of ITP, we have the license to then be able to go out and Nina can um, mm -hmm. negotiate deals for, for her paid bookings. Now those paid bookings are based on brand budgets. So the brand will come to either, they'll come to us and we'll then forward that deal back to ITP or they'll go to ITP direct. And they structure that deal based on the brand budgets and what, what the requirement is from the brands, so how many posts, how many stories. And then we get a very detailed talent brief form. So basically they, they'll come to us and say, right, this is what we need. This is what time you have to post it. This is what we require in it. So it, it's like a joint, it's like a joint contract between Nina and the I brand think. via ITP. Okay. Because ITP is her agency. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So then ITP then manage the payments and then they take a percentage for that deal. Yeah. And then the, the remainder then comes to Nina. So instead of us having to pay for the license, the way that we look at it, the percentage that ITP then charge takes, for us covers. The yeah. fees, and yeah. then we, we don't have to worry about all the legalities for that. So yeah. so there's a right there's like a right way and there's a wrong way of doing it. So that's the right way of doing it now. Um with regards to brand budgets, it varies. There is never a set amount like let's say there's a brand that has a very low budget that Nina really likes and they're saying that we'll pay you X amount and it's not a great amount um, and this is what we would like you to do and Nina sees the affinity to that brand she'll do it mm -hmm. because it's about is this the right brand does this fit what yeah. our brand is and she'll go ahead and do it and then the certain brands that have huge budgets that want her to do a store appearance, they want her to do a masterclass, they want her to really engage with her following and, and attract an audience, they then want to generate sales off the back of that. And then they have different budgets, but all of these budgets are then negotiated through ITP. So there's never, you know, if you're, if you're trying to ask, like, what is the amount that you charge for a post? There isn't a set amount. It depends it on depends, the business and yeah. the brand and the collaboration Correct. type. Yeah. What marketing has worked for? I'm all, almost at the end of the, uh, we've gone quite a, you know, I, we've gone quite a bit detail and deep in the conversation. I think we've crossed one hour or more, <laughs> much more. So um, what marketing, because the podcast is successful marketing for small businesses, and I understand Nina as an influencer, she has this following, which does most of her on almost most of her marketing. But I'm sure you guys do invest in other forms of marketing for the brand, for the mink lashes, for Nina's makeup services. What has worked so far for your brand? This is probably, I would say, the most difficult aspect of, of the business. So everything else, I would say that we have um, we've managed to move forward and and I would say we've moved forward with marketing but it's one of those things where um, it's like a, a big black hole you know you can throw as much money as you want into it <laughs> and you know it's never yeah. ending yeah so we've tried Google ads we've tried um, Instagram ads we've tried Facebook ads we've we've got a new um, Instagram profile set up um, and it's it's one of those things where I don't think we've done it long enough to actually see what is actually working and what isn't because it's not a case of right let's let's change our spend this week yeah for Instagram ad advertising I'll double my spend this week and let's see what the result is because it doesn't work like that it's a very long term thing yeah so it's it's one of those things where um, you can't it's it's not like um, a, a transaction you yeah. know like I'm going to buy this for five dirhams. And I'm going to sell it for 20 dirhams and I've made my 15 dirhams profit. Mm. It's not as clear cut as that. Yet. It's not yet, yet like that. Yeah. No. <laughs> so it's a case of trial and error. You know, put some money in. And, and again, it goes Anything working? Anywhere? I think at, so far I would say what has worked for us in terms of being consistent is one, word of mouth. 
Two, I would say Instagram without us even trying because it, that's a job in itself. So whatever I do there helps to bring in the inquiries. Links, yeah. yeah. Uh, three, I would say is our website with SEO. Mm-hmm. I'd say those are the three things that have been consistent. I, I think to yeah, helping. The, the most, uh, the two biggest things, like Nina said, is Instagram, which is her, her Instagram is very powerful. Um, tool and search engine optimization. You know, I think the the focus that people actually like people think oh, I'll make a website and they think that's the job done. That's where uh, the job begins. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't realise that yeah. want, there is yeah. so much to it. You know, how the blog works, how it's yeah. integrated into it. You, you know, you've got um other people referencing your website which also helps push it up the you know, Google. Yeah. You, you like backlinks. Yeah. I can like see everything. you've learned it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to be on page one of Google, yeah. you know, and yeah. you need to understand the metadata. How does that work yeah. on different pictures? So there's been a big learning curve yeah. where, you know, where it's not a case of just build a website. Look, I think, I think a lot of people think, oh, I've made my website and nobody's coming to it. Yeah. And it's like, what have you done mm. to make push that website on Google? Mm. In front of people, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and that's the hard bit, you yeah. know, and... I guess that for us is where we've really, we, we looked at paid Google ads and we looked at SEO. Paid Google ads, fine, you get the word out there, but the quality of customers that you get aren't always great. You know, you've got to really qualify that lead mm. to then convert that person to, to a sale. sale yeah. Whereas SEO is more natural, it's organic. People go in, they find it, as soon as it's on page one, they'll click on it and then you, you get a more yeah. quality customer through SEO than you would do through through Google Ads. Okay. So I would say SEO has, has been where we have focused predominantly just to push the site up mm-hmm. on Google. Okay, so that's working so far. Do you guys listen to podcasts? I do, yeah. yeah. I Which do sometimes. I haven't really, I'm still kind of like trying out, like listening to different ones. So it's more really when people have sent me like a podcast and I said, listen to this. Yeah. So there isn't any particular one yet, but it is something that I'm really looking into in terms of interested in doing when I've got mm-hmm. a bit more when I can allocate some time, some time for that. that. Yeah. What about books? Do you guys read books? I love reading books. I haven't I haven't read a book in so long. I was just saying this the other day. I really want to read the the new Michelle Obama book, mm-hmm. but um, I do love books. Yeah. So I'm currently reading um, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Robin Sharma. Robin Sharma. Yeah. He's one of my favorite authors. Yeah. And my mentors, I would say. I, I read all his books. And I follow his... Um, his things, I'm in his 5 a.m. club, I wake up at 5 a.m. Oh, and whatever okay. rituals he suggests, I kind of follow, I try to add in my own thing. But Robin Sharma has been one of the most important influential mentor for me to where we are and where I am as a person as well. I think mentors are really important. Yeah. You know, even if it's online, like I really like Gary Vee mm-hmm. as well, you know. Yeah. I think he talks a lot of sense. Yeah. He's, um, he, he just, you know, gets to the point. Yeah. And I really like that. So. You know, in terms of podcasts, I, I like watching his um, IGTVs because, you know, they're, for me, I need about seven, eight minutes. You know, yeah. that's probably as much time as I can sit and, and listen. But any particular kind of personalities you listen to or? Um, I, I, I don't have a specific type of personality, but I do have a strong belief that I need to take advice from somebody who is in a position where you want to be because they are are obviously doing something that works. So do you guys have mentors and um, coaches? I don't specifically have mentor. Like I don't have somebody who is a mentor, but there are people that I would pick up the phone to if I'm ever in a in a sticky situation where I don't know what to do. Um, it's so it's important to have that. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the person that I speak to who's based here in Dubai, um, I, I probably don't speak to him as often as I would like because I understand he's busy as well with his businesses. Yeah. Very shrewd he is. You know, he, he understands business here and he will shine light on on things for me which I probably have completely missed. And, you know, the way his brain works is is just remarkable. So I think it's very important to have, have mentors yeah. like that. Absolutely believe that. Where can people find, uh, if you want to share uh, about Mink Lashes, about how can people follow you on Instagram, please share. So on Instagram, obviously, you can follow me on Nina Ubi. Um, we also have an Instagram page for the lashes, which is Nina Ubi Cosmetics. Um, mm-hmm. The lashes are available in Bloomingdale's, in Harvey Nichols, we're in Dubai Mall, Mall of Emirates. We're in Faces in Mall of Emirates, unas.com online. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also in Areej, in Triano. And we are looking at more locations. So it's quite an exciting year for us. So, yeah. 
And what are we expecting next after the lashes? What's the next product line? Something I'm- is coming soon. <laughs> We're <laughs> it's working still in the on cooking. it. It's still, yeah, it's still cooking. And yeah. Um, yeah, we don't like to say what yet because it's one of those things where we... Um, it's a secret launch. Okay. It's, it's, no, uh, it's not really it's secret, a, but... something in the pipeline. Yeah, um, it's just we can't really say when it's going to happen yeah. because it never happens to plan. So yeah. It's an addition to our product line. Yeah. So it's something that, you know, it's not going to... You, you're not going to be completely surprised by it, but there's um, not so related to eyes, yeah, mm. uh, rules and regulations. Yeah, that, you yeah. have to get everything yeah. registered just like anything else yeah. in, in so this market. It's yeah. the red tape stage that we're at. The mm, okay. So <laughs> as long as we can get past that, then there should be something coming very soon. Awesome. Wish you all the best. Thank, thank you, you, so, thank you much. so much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah. Really Pleasure. And thank this. you for sharing then. All the all the stories, uh, the journey, and a lot of other uh, intimate details as well, important, mm-hmm. yeah. which otherwise has been I don't really share on camera. So it was a pleasure. It was fun talking to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation as well. If you have any questions from Nina or Bobby, feel free to ask us using the comment boxes below from whichever channel you're listening to. I really, really appreciate your time that you're putting in and listening to these episodes um, and these shows. I know we go a little bit beyond time. We, we cross one hour. I've noticed all our podcast episodes are one hour and above and probably it's because the conversations are there's so much to share a lot of a lot of uh, effort goes into an entrepreneur's journey and they go through so many different stages and struggles to reach where their business is and it's important for us to dive down and it's your job to pick up the right elements and, and compare their journey to where they are to your journey where you are and see what elements or what learnings from their, these stories you can apply in your own life So I hope you're getting a lot of value into what we are doing. And uh, thank you again for listening and watching and tuning in. I'll see you next time.